The Immigration and Naturalization Service has been intensifying its efforts to round up people who are illegal aliens, but in doing that, Steve Croft tells us, the government is also rounding up some people who aren't. Javier Hernandez is four years old. He and his two brothers were born at Parkland Hospital in Dallas. They're American-born U.S. citizens, yet they're all facing what amounts to deportation to Mexico, a foreign country they have never seen. Their crime is that their parents are undocumented, and their punishment is that they're, ch they're going to be deprived of their rights and privileges of citizenship. It is their father, Jesse Hernandez, who actually faces deportation. He came to this country illegally in 1968 with his father. They walked at night for two weeks from Imanes, Mexico to Johnson, Texas, looking for work. He cooked and cleaned and picked cotton and dodged immigration officials for 10 years until the government finally said he could stay for a while. Now he has a steady job with the church and all the trappings of American citizenship. But Jesse Hernandez never acquired the green card that would allow him to stay permanently. And this weekend, he was in the streets of Dallas marching. The court order that blocked his deportation for four years has expired. And now he may have to move his American children to Mexico or split up the family. He is just one of 2,200 people in North Texas and Oklahoma facing the same dilemma. Besides taking their cause into the streets, they've taken it into a federal courtroom. Days ago, attorneys filed a $5 million class action lawsuit to block the Immigration Service from deporting families with American children. But William Chambers, the INS district director in Dallas, says there is no legal status for those with illegal beginnings. It has gone through the court system, it has gone to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court has upheld the fact that this is not illegal to do this. There is public pressure on Congress to tighten, not relax, immigration policy. But Jesse Hernandez knows if immigration laws keep him out, the Rio Grande will not. If immigration sends me to Mexico, I got to come back. Steve Croft, CBS News, Dallas. charts from your high school government class, how a bill gets through Congress, starts in a committee and then goes to the floor of the House or Senate, 
and then to a conference committee and eventually on to the president's desk. On the charts, it seems a smooth process. On Capitol Hill, it is not, especially when the issue is one as complicated as immigration. Ed Rabel reports our cover story, Border Politics. Okay, uh, he's on the uh, inside uh, fence there, North River. Come back over and there. He's right now there. Mr. Speaker, the stench from the rotting carcass of arrogant political partisanship lies heavily on the air of this chamber today. Mr. Speaker, your announced refusal to allow consideration of the immigration bill does a disservice to my constituents, to my part of the country, and to the entire nation. Speaker O'Neill, I wish to express my strong support for your announcement yesterday and my thanks that the Simpson-Mazzoli bill will not come to the floor for a vote this year due to strong opposition from the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, of which I'm a member, and as a result of mixed signals from the President, who one minute says he supports the bill, and the next minute says he's not sure. If the Speaker doesn't want the bill to be debated or voted on, it's dead. There will be no debate. There will be no vote. Now everyone should silently apologize to George III, and that's your civics lesson for the day. Every year, millions of illegal aliens, most of them from Mexico, burst across the border stretching from California to Texas in a desperate search for work, for a job. We had a group of about four or five that came out of here. That small heel is here. Yeah. It is Mario Garcia's job and Travis Johnson's to stop them, to catch them and send them back. The Border Patrol has only 1,900 men to police the Mexican border. The border is more than 2,000 miles long. It's an impossible job. It's something that's going to continue and something that uh, I personally don't feel can ever be stopped. Uh, the only thing we can do is try our best to try to slow it. Uh, but w I don't feel that we'll able, ever be able to, uh, to stop it completely. In the past 12 months, the Border Patrol captured more than a million people who were trying to cross over illegally, a record. But nobody knows for sure how many were not caught. Maybe four million were not caught, maybe more. It's rather frustrating, really, uh, to come out here and find all the sign and not be able to apprehend them, knowing that we lost 30 or 40 during the night. Not all those who come in stay. Some work at menial jobs for a short time, then go back across the border. Some try to stay to make lives for themselves here. Nobody knows how many. The United States doesn't like to admit it, but it does not control its own border with Mexico. This year, Congress moved to take control. In May, by an overwhelming vote, the Senate passed the most sweeping immigration policy in more than 30 years. The central provision of the Senate bill seeks to halt illegal aliens by cutting off their main reason for coming, jobs. Employers who knowingly hire illegal aliens could be fined or even imprisoned. The bill also requires job applicants to offer proof they are in the country legally and are eligible to work. And it offers amnesty to many illegal aliens already here. Though tough, the Senate bill does not appear to be racist or mean-spirited. But in the House, a compromised version of the bill was suddenly and unexpectedly shelved by Speaker Tip O'Neill. It was the Hispanic vote that elected Mark White, the governor of Texas. And you elected four new Hispanic members to the Congress of the United States. I want to say this. You not only impressed the leadership of the Democratic Party, but you scared hell out of the Republican Party. 
You worry them so much. I think it's blatant, cynical, partisan politics. The Speaker of the House is not a czar. He is not a dictator. He's not even the Prime Minister. Roger Connor is Executive Director of FAIR, Federation for American Immigration Reform, a strong supporter of the immigration bill. It has bipartisan support, and now one man, Tip O'Neill, has said he simply will not allow the bill to be voted on. It's a bill that a majority of the members of the Congress would vote for. It would pass. Maybe, but there are good reasons to believe the bill would not have passed. Hispanic Americans, the fastest growing minority in the United States, most strongly opposed the bill, though they were not alone. They feared employers would play it safe and hire non-Hispanics rather than risk hiring illegals. They feared that they'd be targets of discrimination, that they'd be singled out under a national system of identification. According to O'Neill, the Hispanics have said that it's the worst thing that has ever confronted them. What were the factors that drove uh, Tip O'Neill, do you think, specifically? Well, I think, uh, first of all, the, the prospect that uh, Ronald Reagan might have vetoed such a bill and thereby cut into the margins of the Hispanic vote. That's number one. I am indeed. Haynes Johnson is a political writer for the Washington Post. Uh, there are splits in the ranks of labor. There are splits in the ranks of liberals. Uh, across the board, uh, there are people who disagree with virtually every portion of the bill. And why alienate them in terms of a democratic leadership position where you have the alternative of doing nothing? At the border near McAllen, Texas, across from Reynosa, Mexico, the problem of illegal immigration focuses, becomes relentless. You speak English? Yes, sir. These are not aliens. They are Mexican Americans who are used to being stopped and questioned, but their resentment shows. How long you live in Mission? About two years. <laughs> <laughs> Travis Johnson and Mario Garcia continued their search for people whose impulse it is to seek a better life in America. It would take a mighty cold individual not to feel something for these people that are coming across. Uh, in a lot of instances, you have people that are uh, coming across for strictly economic reasons that uh, are uh, very visibly poor and have no means of, of supporting themselves or their families in these countries that they're coming from. And uh, there have been many instances where we've run across people that have not eaten for several days, have gone without water, uh, are barefoot. There are greater themes at work here than politics. There are issues about fundamental American beliefs, about how we view ourselves and our own immigrant past. The area around McAllen is as good a place as any to explore these themes, better, in fact, than most, because here the border seems tenuous. It is time to harvest cucumbers in the Rio Grande Valley. Like Americans everywhere, the people who live here are of two minds about immigration, to let them in or to keep them out. It is an issue they face every day. Othel Brand. Those of us who live and work here see these people coming across the river, a river from our farms and along the dusty roads. And there's, there's, you could talk to the people who are here today and you'd find that all of us have this experience. It is a reality, it isn't something we we think exists, but uh, we must stop it. My parents having come from Mexico and having seen the suffering that they went through. Juanita Valdez Cox. To, to, to get across and to make a, a life here, uh, it's, it's real close, it's real close to us and, and we just have a, we have a right to, to, to or they have a right to survive and, and, and poor, I don't feel that we, it's up to, to us to uh, close the borders or not to, to let them across. If that's what they're trying to do, I can't see myself as, as saying, well, no, you know, you, you can't come across. 
they have a right. I think we have lots of jobs Marvin Schwartz. for those people, and we can help Mexico with those problems. But it had, they have to be here on a legal basis. And, and that's, that's how to solve it. These people come here... Rodolfo Moreno. ...with the, with the idea that, that they're coming to better their lives, and they're coming here to work. They're not coming here to live on uh, non-welfare, like some people assume that they're coming here and take and drain uh, welfare funds and use on them. They, they're, people are coming to work. They're coming here to survive. And uh, I don't see that as, as any threat. 3-4, 3-19. Go ahead, 319. You might want to cut that 294 out of my yard. I got one here, but that never showed up. I didn't go down there and cut. Right, Still, there are contradictions. A growing number of Hispanic Americans favor stricter enforcement of immigration laws. For now, though, the proposed bill to apply more control on immigration has been shelved, and Congress is not likely to take it up in 1984, an election year. Maybe it will in 1985. There are greater themes at work here than politics. There is the matter of the human heart. Am I my brother's keeper? They resent the alien coming over and taking the jobs. We get calls uh, more every day now reporting aliens. Uh, in fact, uh, most of the time, we don't have the manpower to go out and apprehend these people. But they are, they seem to be helping us a lot more. They're calling in more, reporting these people. The people that live here, they, they worry about, if a lot of people came from Mexico, see, and... Nate Ovalle. Uh, they're taking the, the jobs away from them. Quite often, I'm told by aliens that I've apprehended that uh, I also am a Mexican. And uh, for that reason, I should allow them either time to get, uh, to get a head start or time to, uh, to get away completely or just allow them to pass without having apprehended them. What do you say to those people? I tell them that I'm an agent, that I have a job to perform, that in performing this job, uh, I support my family and that I can't risk what I have uh, to assist them in this manner. Suddenly, in the early afternoon, Johnson and Garcia spot two young men. They'd been hiding in a ditch alongside a field less than a mile from the border. They are illegal aliens, and they are obviously shaken. One of them is carrying a map on which the road to Houston is marked. They say they've traveled hundreds of miles from deep in Mexico's interior to try to reach Houston. They say they do not know anyone in Houston, that they have come to the United States to study and to work. But in reality, you want to work. One of the men is 21, the other 18. The 18-year-old says he was not afraid to come to the United States. This is the only country where there is any hope, he says. When there is no work in your own country, he says, when you are afraid you will die, you will do anything to hope. Less than an hour later, the two agree to return to Mexico. Nearby, other illegal aliens caught by the Border Patrol are also being processed. In eight hours near McAllen, Texas, the Border Patrol has captured 12 illegal aliens. Nobody knows for sure how many were not caught. There is no hope for them this day. Maybe they will try again. Nobody knows for sure. Haynes Johnson. Uh, we've always had uh... Uh, a sort of sense of Americans, uh, of a conflict between our principles and our dreams, uh, the conflict between America, the land of openness and opportunity, and America, the land of isolation. Keeping our borders to ourselves has always been one of the great conflicts and strains, and it's still there, and it's even more so now. 
Roger Connor. There was a time when the Statue of Liberty was built in 1890, fewer than 100 million people in this country. And times have changed since then. There, we needed the immigrants to build the industrial Northeast. So times have changed since we could afford unlimited immigration. We cannot afford that anymore. If people are looking for, to the United States as a way of survival, we should be against it. We should be proud that this is, that this is a country where, that people look up to. And, and instead of taking it in such a negative way, work towards more, more positive ways to, to make their dream that they have in, the, in their minds when they come across that this is a country for all, a land for all to come. X-ray three all five. Go ahead. Do you have any more traffic? Uh, Tahano area? Two hits on 107 this morning at uh, yeah. zero-one-forty-nine. If you've got traffic there, it's pretty old. Leaders of the Hispanic community in Houston are denouncing a federal judge for the light sentences he imposed on three city police officers convicted of killing a Mexican-American after they arrested him for intoxication. Judge Ross Sterling originally gave the officers one year in prison, but a federal appeals court ruled the sentence was too short and ordered the judge to re-sentence the men. So Judge Sterling complied by adding one day to the original sentences. More from David Dick. The three former Houston police officers, Stephen Orlando, Joseph Yanish, and Terry Denson, hurriedly left the federal courthouse without making any statements. They remain free on bond. Their new sentence, one year and one day, to run concurrently with one-year terms already imposed for the beating of 23-year-old Joe Campos Torres. His body was found in 1977 in a bow, a stream of water that runs through downtown Houston. The three officers had been accused of throwing Torres into the water. Two juries have heard that accusation and all of the witnesses testify relative to that accusation and found them not guilty of pushing them into the bow. Uh, the judge uh, who imposed sentence in this apparently uh, took heed to what those two juries, 24 citizens of this state, have said. Well, what it means in pro for practical purposes is we have essentially the same sentence that we started off with. We're very pleased with that. We do not intend to appeal that. Uh, I think the Tories case here in Houston is finally over with. The case itself may be over, but not the angry reaction in the Latin American community. I leave the responsibility totally on the judge being insensitive. He needs to be removed. Legally, you know, the action is that it's very hard to remove him under the statutes, but we are going to be mobilizing and taking whatever action is deemed necessary. Since no appeal is planned, the three are expected to begin their terms in a few weeks. A defense attorney says they could be out on parole within 10 months. David Dick, CBS News, Houston. Well, it turns out that a Frenchman's castle may no longer be his home. And it With turns American out that and other banks on restructuring and stringing out their loan paybacks in the face of drastic drops in Mexican oil revenue. Perhaps no moment would better symbolize the meaning of this week's salute to the Statue of Liberty than the swearing in of new citizens Thursday night. They might stand for the some 600,000 legal aliens who come to this country each year, but they are only part of the story. It's estimated there are anywhere from 300,000 to 2 million illegal aliens arriving every year in the United States. Far from the lady who lifts her lamp beside the golden door, national correspondent Bernard Goldberg looks at some illegal aliens, why they run the risks to come and what they find after they arrive. It's 9.30 just outside El Paso, Texas, less than a mile from Mexico. A freight train is passing bound for California and U.S. Border Patrol agents have been waiting for it. They're looking for human cargo. The cargo this night is children, illegal alien children. The youngest is just 12. Another border crossing, this one between Tijuana, Mexico and San Diego County, California. Around here, the golden door is a hole in the fence, and a family has just been caught sneaking through it. She said she came across to try to find work to support her kids. Something new is happening along the border. 
in the old days, people would come north for six months or three months and make enough money to go home and help their family in Mexico. Now they're bringing the whole family north. They're saying, America, El Paso, Texas, New Mexico, New York, this is my home now. They're not going back to Mexico anymore. It's dusk and they're waiting for nightfall when it's easier to get in. They're part of the greatest wave of illegal immigration in U.S. history. In 1965, the Border Patrol made 110,000 arrests nationwide. In 1975, 766,000. This year, an estimated 1,800,000. And for every one the Border Patrol catches, at least one more makes it through. You catch the same guy three, maybe four days running. You'll see him. And then all at once, you don't see the guy no more. Now, does that mean that the guy gave up and he went all the way back to Guadalajara? What do you think? I think that means that this time he finally made it. They all say they need jobs, that they can't survive in Mexico anymore. Once, the Statue of Liberty was only a vague and abstract promise to the tired and poor. Today, for them, it's a literal invitation. Come to America, bring the family, stay a while, stay forever. The idea that we can blindly say, give me your tired, your poor, your homeless yearning to be free, when we don't even do a good job on our homeless, our poor, uh, that I think is absurd. Absurd or not, in this country, it is not illegal to hire an illegal. So federal agents may raid a construction site in Denver and round up the usual suspects, illegal aliens, but everyone knows they'll be back. Because, officials say, until it becomes a crime to hire illegals, the United States is sending a message. And that message simply says, if you can make it past this little thin green line of Border Patrol agents, if you can make it past us, you'll get a job, we'll educate your children, we'll take care of you, we'll, we'll ignore your illegal status. And there are those who say that's exactly how it ought to be. I say that, that we were here before the pilgrims landed in, in, in New England. Uh, we have a historical and a legal right to be here. Um, Do you have a, a right to, to sneak through the fence? We have a right to come to our homeland. But when they come, they often find the dark side of immigration in America. While these illegals were working a field in California, a Border Patrol agent showed us how they live and how they hide. These are their homes. However, the aliens live underneath this structure, in the ground. See all the mice See and the rats? Rat? Yeah, and the rats and mice. And this is where they live. Now, what is this? This is an entrance? That's an entrance. That's, that's where they sleep, right in there. It's like living like rats. Just like rats. I think it's probably better for rats. Rats are used to it. Humans aren't. Still, they keep coming. The lights of Tijuana behind them, the prospect of a better life just up ahead. They keep coming to join the millions of other illegals already living in the United States, perhaps 12 million. So anybody who's determined to get through sooner or later, if they're determined, they're going to make it. It's not that hard. It's really not that hard. So along this border, there's nothing vague or abstract about the Statue of Liberty's promise to the tired and poor. America is having a party this week, and they're coming, formal invitation or not. Bernard Goldberg, CBS News, along the Mexican border in California. South of the Mexican border, a motorized checkout line crawls toward El Paso. The Mexican government has begun enforcing its crackdown on foodstuffs embargoed for purchase by foreigners. And the customs men are stepping one out of three, stopping one out of three vehicles to search for contraband, that is the edible variety. Tortillas, bread, vegetables. Since the devaluation of the peso, foreigners have been heading south to raid the Mexican grocery shelves. Sugar, for instance, sells for 10 cents a pound or less. So far, customs merely warns the offenders, but a week from now, they're going to begin confiscation. In the how do the United States and Mexico get along? Disagreeably, as usual. Let me count the ways. Oil, immigration, fishing rights, unrest in Central America of the sort that's going on in El Salvador today, trade. The United States and Mexico disagree on all those things and on many others. The United States and Mexico just do not speak the same language. Our Sunday morning cover story, reported by Ed Rabel. Mexico and us.
A Mexican ruler once said, poor Mexico, so far from God and so close to the United States. There was a time when Mexicans did not have to come here this way. This was their land, San Diego, San Francisco, Tucson, Santa Fe, places Mexicans could call home. Now they must have permission to come and work here. Without it, they are called illegal aliens. Bueno, me me decidí de estar aquí, me decidí ir por ellos hasta allá. Entonces me los traje por por el río. This family crossed the Rio Grande on an inner tube. Abandoned by their guides, they walked through snake-infested wasteland. They said they would do it repeatedly to get to America. Por tal del bien de mi familia, puede ser que se arriesgue mucho. Pues sí, sí existe, sí existe siempre. Pero este, tratar, por tratar de, 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 de vivir un poco mejor, de estar mejor en los Estados Unidos, es lo que trata uno, por eso venirse para acá. Bueno, pues eh, primeramente la educación de mis hijos, que dominen los dos idiomas. Y, y es, entonces, este, pues creo que aquí hay más posibilidades de que si ellos estudian, pueden hacer este, algo mejor, ya que aquí hay mejor oportunidad. Quizás con el tiempo puedan dar, tener mejor oportunidad de ellos que la que tenemos como nosotros que vinimos de allá, ya grandes. Todos estaban en el polvo del estupó y es que no habían entendido el episodio de los panes. Pues The language is Spanish. Hermanos y hermanas, esta es palabra de Dios. Amen. The people are Spanish descendants. In fact, Spanish descendants account for more than half of this city's population. It is San Antonio, the 10th largest city in the United States. It too was once a part of Mexico. As the Mexicans see it, we took uh, one third of the uh, historic Mexican territory away from them. This is something that I don't think lies strongly in the mind of Americans. The, you know, the winners don't think of it quite this way. Dateline, Columbus, New Mexico, March 9th, 1916. There have been several hundred actual violations of Mexican territory or Mexican sovereignty uh, by the United States. These are still raw wounds. They're very conscious of it. And to them, it was a humiliation. It was a sign that uh, we did not respect them as a fully sovereign nation. Historian T.R. Fehrenbach writes about Mexico and Texas. Uh, there is a definite feeling in Mexico that somehow the rise of this great, powerful English-speaking nation, this colossus of the North, on the North American continent, aborted and thwarted their history, which could have been the rise of a 200 million strong Spanish-speaking empire. When you've been quarreling with your neighbors for nearly a hundred years, making up is hard to do. But last week, Ronald Reagan went over to his neighbor's house to try to patch things up. This was the first meeting ever between an American president-elect and the president of Mexico. The idea that the new Reagan administration will become militarily involved in El Salvador's internal affairs is a big issue in Mexico. The rest of Latin America looks to Mexico as a leader in that part of the world. President Lopez Portillo has already warned America not to interfere. Just how much of its billions of barrels of oil Mexico will be willing to deliver to us is a big issue in the United States. Lopez Portillo says Mexico will limit its production. Because of Mexico's political and economic importance, America is paying its southern neighbor more attention than ever before. Americans want more and more of Mexico's oil to keep flowing across the border. But what many don't want crossing over are the Mexicans themselves, the hundreds of thousands who come here illegally in search of jobs. Works hard enough as it is. It's hard to make a living without them guys coming over here and taking it away from us. It takes uh, work away from uh, a man from the United States, from his own country. And uh, wages, of course, will, dro will drop because they'll work for little or nothing. What do you think the government ought to do? 
They need to stop it. Uh, it has to come from the government to stop it. They have to uh, only be uh, legal people working here or leave them back where they let them work where they come from. And we couldn't work in Mexico. <laughs> they don't allow that. The people over here in the United States, they got to make a living too. And so why should they come back from over across the border and then come back in and take your job away from you? Mexican workers entering America unlawfully represent the most nagging, if not the biggest point of conflict between the United States and Mexico. Some illegal aliens are currently employed at this San Antonio salvage yard, which has been raided several times by immigration officials. However, their employer, Alton Newell, keeps hiring them and denies that they take jobs that U.S. citizens want. Let me say it truthfully, with our welfare and food stamp program here, a lot of people don't want to work. If we didn't have any illegal aliens, I would say we would be short of labor because our people are not, uh, are not looking for this kind of work. And like I said a while ago, with uh, welfare and food stamps and unemployment compensation, uh, a lot of people don't want to work. There is the view that America would have a tough time without the undocumented workers. There is also the view that Mexico would have even a tougher time with them. Uh, Mexico has a, a typical third world economy in the sense it's a very poor industrial infrastructure, has very, a very low impoverished base. Uh, it is not industrializing or creating jobs or opportunity. Uh, nearly as fast as its population is rising. Consequently, they need the safety valve. They need to send some millions of their young people to work in the United States, where they not only get rid of them in their unrest at home. Remember, 40% of the Mexican working population is either unemployed or underemployed. It's a figure, it's, it boggles the mind. If we do not help Mexico, in some sense, solve this demographic time bomb, then we can absolutely destroy uh, uh, a regime such as Lopez Partillo's. And what we would get would probably be much less to our liking. They are so desperate, so hungry to come here that they are willing to risk anything, even death. Many died last year after the guides they hired to protect them from the border patrol abandoned them in the scorching desert. 16-year-old Santiago Flores is an illegal alien from Matamoros. He says he paid some men $600 for safe passage across the border to the U.S., but that he went without food for five days during the dangerous journey. Serafin Rodriguez earns $5.75 an hour in San Antonio as a construction worker. In his Mexican hometown, he could find no work. He also is here illegally. It's better over here than Mexico because you can make in some more money over here than Mexico because over there you don't got too much jobs and uh, she's got a lot of troubles over there. I need to open a uh, business over there, a big business and make you a lot of works over there. That's why the people come here. That's why come here, not come here for making uh, uh, any troubles, nothing like that. This is why I come here, because I, over there, you know, got too much jobs. I'm gonna stay here because, and the first thing, I got my wife, and, uh, and then other things, I don't got nothing to do in, to Mexico. I don't like Mexico. Rodriguez married a United States citizen, a Mexican-American. He hopes to become a citizen one day. He and his wife are starting their lives together in America in the $60 a month tumble-down house on San Antonio's southwest side. It is, they believe, a beginning. Franklin Roosevelt said it, remember, remember always that all of us are descended from immigrants. This family of illegal aliens wants to be part of that tradition, be it legally or illegally. And one family member already is legally. Rachel was born here. She is a United States citizen, the beginning for this family of the realization of the American dream. Well, pues, pues, para mí es muy bonito. 
porque, porque al, al, al ser yo ciudadano americano, quiere decir que ya, ya puedo vivir más a gusto y tratar de progresar mejor, comprar una casa, porque así como estoy, pues no, no puedo echarme un compromiso en una casa. 